What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Absolute Strength Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Hunt, and we're back with another episode. And today's guest is Charlie Dixon, 83-kilogram USAPL IPF lifter. Really strong kid. He, uh, he's jacked, too. I'll tell you what, if you go look at his Instagram, when he had longer hair, he looked like a young Dan Green. No joke. Go look at his Instagram. Report back. I'm pretty sure you'll agree. But no, dude... Really strong kid, and uh, we had a lot of fun. This was a cool conversation. We just turned on the mic and went to town. Turns out, Charlie has a wrestling background, so you guys know me. We had to we had to spend some time on that, digging into that, and then it, we kind of transitioned into talking about weight cutting for, for powerlifting. He had a big cut for nationals last year, so we go went over his his uh, protocol for that. It was really interesting. I think you guys will, will take some some good things from that. And we really, we just talked about training, talked about, you know, balancing going to school with training and and time management and and everything like that. I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. Really laid back conversation and we had a lot of fun. All right, before we get into the episode, a couple things. One, as always, if you can just tell one friend, one friend about the Absolute Strength Podcast, I'll forever be grateful. And two, if you're listening to these episodes regularly, on whatever, you know, iTunes, YouTube, even though not a lot of people listen on YouTube. It's mostly iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, things like that. Make sure you're subscribed. I have a ton, a ton of podcasts planned already scheduled for the next few weeks. So they're going to be coming at you rapid fire, rapid fire episodes, and I don't want you to miss any. So please just subscribe and um, then you won't, then you won't miss any. All right, without further ado, Charlie Dixon. Awesome, man. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, thanks for uh, doing it, man. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. I uh, listened to your podcast, I guess, since you had Sean Noriega on yep. last year. Yeah, it was probably about yeah, a year yeah. ago then. Yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah, man. man. Awesome. So yeah. how's uh, yeah, how's your week going? That, uh, it feels like I know you so well. You know what I mean? Like uh, <laughs> just having the podcast, you know, driving to school or whatever. So yeah, it's funny how that happens. How that works. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. With the, with like podcasting and, and YouTube and stuff, you feel like you like you listen or, or watch these people, and you feel like you know them, and then uh, you meet them in person or something, and it's kind of weird. Cause you're like, oh fuck, I feel like I know you, but I've never met you before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's cool, Absolutely. though, because you, you really do, like, get to, to know these people, especially with podcasting, I feel like, because they're so long form. I mean, it's like an hour long episode, and especially if you put them out a lot, which I, you know, I, I think I'm at like 120 some episodes. So it's like, how many hours of, of just listening to me talking if you've heard most of them, you know? Yeah, and that's the, the cool thing about it. You know, I hear you talk about the Jocko podcast and other things like that. You know, you listen to these people long enough you get a feel for how they think. And it's like, now if I'm like going through all my day and some shit goes down, I hear Jocko just going off like, good. And you know good. what I mean? It's like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. well, what's so, cool about podcasting, in, in my opinion, is, well, there's a lot of things, but one of the biggest things, I think, in, in terms of, um, like, content-wise, is you can listen to a podcast while you're driving to work or while you're doing other things, and you can, it's almost like background noise, but like you said, if you listen to enough of them from one person, like with Jocko, perfect example, like you just, you, it feels like you're friends with him. Like you have him in your head whenever you're going through shit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. What absolutely. other, uh, what other podcasts do you like? Uh, so I started out, I think I started out with Mark Bell's PowerCast in like 2014. That's yep. when I first got into powerlifting. Um, I listened to that for a while. And then, uh, Joe Rogan, of course, he always has some good ones. Yeah. Um, I think that's how I got turned on to the Jocko podcast with to uh to Joe and then um yeah, I listen to uh to your podcast as well. Um and then uh Revive Stronger and some of those other ones in the the fitness industry I listen to some of those. Yeah, cool. So well, so let's get into it here. You uh you said you got into the powerlifting in when? Uh twenty fourteen. Really? So really not that long ago. Well four four yeah, years ago. Yeah, yeah. So uh I know you have a big wrestling background, and uh, I do too. So I awesome. relate to a lot of yeah, yeah. Um, so I started wrestling in like middle school. I was say you uh, you, uh, you look like a wrestler. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. So the weight cutting and singlet, you know, it all just kind of made sense. Yeah, per, that's you know what, when when I used to wrestle, um, most of the time if I if I ever got beat, I was like such a poor sport. Like I would get beat, and then this is even before I started lifting. This is probably even like middle school. But I'd get like beat by a kid, and then afterwards I would just be sitting there and be like, man. If, if there was like some competition to determine if who was stronger, I would definitely win that. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. It was, it was man. funny though. And I didn't even like think of it, but then when you really put it in perspective, it's like, oh, well, yeah, it's called powerlifting. Yeah. And that's, you know, when I first uh, got into it, both my brothers wrestled and uh, they kind of got me into it and they took me to like an open mat. I was like in middle school. You know, I was doing really, really well against these uh, local guys and uh, kind of got me hooked. I remember going to my first tournament. I didn't have to wrestle Kyle Day. Yeah. Like that, but, uh, <laughs> um, the first guy I wrestled, he was from like the Virginia Beach area. Where are you I'm from? A, I'm from uh, Covington, Virginia. It's really, really small town. What's and, that near? Uh, uh, near, hmm, like near the uh, border of West Virginia and Virginia. Okay. Red Oaks probably. Yeah, okay. Like kind of where Virginia Tech's at in that right. area. Okay. Yeah, so... Um, First tournament and go out and, you know, I think I'm going to, you know, do awesome, do all these crazy moves and stuff. And the guy comes out and tech falls me in like the second period. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So I, I kind of wanted to quit after that. Uh, the second match I lost to, um, but, you know, being, you know, the youngest of the two older brothers, they, they kind of kept me on the right path and wouldn't let me make excuses or anything like that. That, that must've been a pretty cool yeah. dynamic. I, uh, I'm, the, I have two, uh, half sisters so I'm almost I'm really almost like and they're significantly younger than me so I'm almost kind of like an only child I've always wondered how uh, the dynamic would be if I had older brothers because you see a lot of um a lot of athletes that are that like really excel a lot of times they have either older brothers or younger brothers perfect example is um the Jones brothers John Jones Arthur Jones uh, Chandler Jones like I just wonder like man that growing up in that household must have been insane (laughs) Hey, I can imagine, man. You know, they're actually, yeah, they're, yeah. I mean, they're only, they, they grew up about a half hour, 45 minutes from me, but, um, yeah, it's crazy. Just like two guys in the NFL, John, just a complete badass. That would have been wild. Yeah. I would have loved to see him wrestle in high school. You know, what's wild about, uh, John is he, um, I mean, he was, he was really good, but he wasn't like. I mean, I'm gonna say this, but it, this makes it sound crazy. But he was only a, like a one-time New York State champ. I think. I think he only won states once. I think he took fourth like the other time. Which I mean, that's still incredible. I mean, New York State's pretty tough for wrestling. But you would never have watched him in high school and said, "Oh wow, when he gets into the MMA, like no one's gonna be able to touch him." Uh, I mean, I even I remember my because he was a senior when I was in eighth grade, and the first time I ever saw him was uh, early in the year. It was just like a, a local tournament. It was the EFA Elmira Christmas tournament. Pretty good sized tournament, but nothing nothing crazy. And uh, he wrestled a, another local guy and had a really tough match in the finals. Like this was a senior year. Like he, you know, almost got beat. Uh, then that year he ended up winning the state title. I think he won like maybe in the state final, like two to one or something. So I mean, he he was great. And uh, you could definitely, I will say this though, you could definitely tell that his movement for a bigger guy was just something yeah. that most people didn't have. Same with his brother, actually, Arthur Jones, his his brother who played in the NFL. He was a heavyweight, um, and John only wrestled, I think, like 189, 215, but his brother wrestled 275, and his movement, too, was just like, you didn't see that out of heavyweights very often. That's scary. Yeah. <laughs> like, I saw his, his brother, like, ankle pick somebody once. as a heavyweight. <laughs> like, you never see that. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So you got into wrestling in middle school, and then uh, how did how did that evolve? Yeah. So got into wrestling in middle school, and uh, I carried that over into high school. I wrestled 103 my freshman year. Yeah, I can relate. Um, yeah, yeah. I was just a really really small guy, and uh, I did pretty well. I made it to uh, the region finals that year. Um, I was wrestling the only guy to beat me the entire season. So you know, it was it was a I was very excited for that, and mm-hmm. I got out to an early lead and around the second period, halfway through. We got in this weird transition, just felt my knee pop. Oh, wow. Uh, so that, yeah, athletic trainer came out and did some tests. You know, she asked me if I wanted to wrestle. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to keep going, you know what yeah. I mean? So 
I just threw it out that uh, I just kind of stalled the rest of the match. I couldn't straighten my knee. Um, and uh, I got an MRI schedule for the following Wednesday. The state tournament, of course, is a week later. Mm-hmm. So I remember going in Monday to advance PE, just being hard-headed. And everyone else is shooting basketball, having a good time. I go in the weight room and load up the leg press. They, you know, I need to make my oh, legs boy. stronger. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I get done with that, man, and I was like lifted even worse. And I think I, just, I, I fucked it up pretty bad. Oh, shit. And uh, yeah, so I, I go and get the MRI Wednesday and have like a torn meniscus and uh, had to get surgery and all that. So that was probably the, the first real setback I had with wrestling but it also got me really interested in uh strength training and bodybuilding and things like that and that's when i started you know going to bodybuilding.com looking through all these different workout templates and stuff and uh i just did a lot of my own rehab for my legs my mom had one of those weird like bow flex type machines yep. i did a lot of single leg stuff um i just fell in love with it man i started doing uh this really high volume type of training uh, you know, like work up to like a set of three sets of eight and then hit like 225 or two sets of 20. Mm-hmm. So like I'm puking and all that. And, uh, you know, it was really cool. I just kind of became known as the guy who does all these crazy workouts and it just became an addiction for me early on. Yeah, I think a lot of people can relate to that. You know, it's either either you get into training from from with sports, whether it's for strength and conditioning stuff, but then also you see a lot of people who get into it just from a rehab sense. Like, okay, I'm I'm injured. Maybe I can't play the sport now. I need to try to get stronger. And then you start digging down into that that rabbit hole. And then once you once you get into it, it's like, man, you're you're just hooked. Yeah. Absolutely. Dude. For for me, it was because I was such a small kid wrestling like ninety six and one hundred three. I was like, I just gotta get a little bit bigger and stronger. And I always knew that like I was naturally strong, so I thought I would I would take to it pretty well. But then once I started lifting, I was like, holy shit, this is like this is my thing. Like even it even took over wrestling for me. Just like the mindset was just like every day I just had to had to work out. Like I think, I man, I think that's sometimes hard to. Um, it's hard to explain to people who who might not feel that way about training. Like it's if you are really passionate about it and really really love it, like like when you go on vacation, it's people always ask me like, oh why why do you work out when you're on vacation? It's because it's my favorite thing to do. That's why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man, and it just a lot of people don't have that fire, I guess, about it. You know, it's it's really. I don't know. I feel grateful in a lot of ways to just have that ability to just be really passionate about something. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm, I, I, I sometimes think I'm like, man, if I didn't find, uh, lifting weights, would I have found something else? I'm just as passionate yeah. about, I don't know. I don't like right now. I feel like it would be hard to say that I would have because there's really, um, I mean, outside of, of, of sports and, and training and in, in this stuff, it's, but then again, it, it's hard to really say because this takes up such a large part of my life that I'm not really free. Like, my, I don't have the free time or the free mind space to really pursue a lot of other things. So I don't yeah. know. It's hard to say. But I am I am grateful that I w- was able to f- find something that I'm super passionate about and also passionate about for an extended period of time. Because sometimes yeah. in, in – I think everyone goes through this too where there's there's just certain phases of your life different ages where you you find something and you're like oh this is really cool i like this but then you get burnt out after you know a year or two and then you move on to the next thing and i think that's that's fitness for a lot of people yeah did that happen for you with wrestling where you kind of transition more towards the training side of things yeah well for me is i started wrestling really young um i was uh like six, I think five or six years old when I started wrestling, and uh, like it, wrestling is pretty big in my family. Specifically, my dad, like he's a, a complete nut about wrestling, which is which is good. It like helped you know kind of you know escalate my uh, my interest into it at least initially. Um, but then, well, no, so I, I played other sports when I was little. I think this is something too that's important. Is I played other sports, played football, and. I really, really enjoyed playing football when I was little. I mean, I was like the tiniest kid out there, but I was I was pretty good. And and, uh, and then, of course, when I got older, I just stayed tiny, so I couldn't really play football yeah. anymore. Um, I played in middle school, but then actually my, my freshman year of high school, I tried out for uh, the, the football team. And during the summer, I go through all the two-a-days and everything, 
And I'm like playing with all the, the same kids that I played with throughout my life when we were little. But like the high school coaches just didn't take me serious because I was like 85 pounds. So yeah. like I didn't like I would go through all the conditioning, all the, the bullshit stuff. But then when we'd actually go to like team stuff, I was like fifth string. Like I would never even get a chance to, to practice. And, and I guess it's like, all right, well, I should have just probably stuck it out. But I think mentally it was hard for me because like I played with those kids when I was little. I'm like, OK, why are all these kids playing ahead of me when I was like twice as good as them? And when we were little, you know, I get it. They're 150 yeah. pounds and I'm 80. So I get that side of it. But so then I quit. And, um, you know, looking back, I think that was, uh, that was, it was probably an important thing because I have a, a very, uh, like if I'm into something, I am all fucking into it. So that's what happened. So as soon as I quit football, like wrestling was my only thing. I was like, okay, I'm going all into this shit. And then I just burnt myself out. Yeah. Yeah. So you wrestled all throughout high school. Yeah. And then actually I didn't even end up wrestling my senior year. So that's how that's how crazy really? it got. Yeah. So after my junior year, I was pretty much um, I was done with it. I just was just mentally fatigued. I mean, there was some other shit, some personal stuff that went on, like with my family and stuff. But uh, um, yeah, I was just like mentally fatigued with it. And on the flip side, training became that thing that I was super obsessed with. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have to cut a lot of weight? So I didn't cut. So actually, my eighth grade year, I wrestled varsity as an eighth grader. And I only weighed like 80 pounds, 85 pounds. And the minimum to wrestle 96 in New York State was 88. So every morning when we would be going to a tournament, like the whole bus ride, I'd be pounding Gatorade, like drinking and eating like donuts and shit just to make sure wow. I could make the like the minimum weight. You know what I mean? And <laughs> yeah, then uh, so then the next year, my freshman year, I was wrestling 96 and 103. Weight wasn't really an issue at all. And then my sophomore year, that's when I started cutting, like, a crazy amount of weight. I weighed um, – I started growing and stuff, and I, I was, like, 120 pounds in the summer, about maybe, like, 115 by the start of uh, of wrestling season. And in my head, I was like, all right, I'm just going to wrestle 103, so it'll be, like, 10 pounds. You know, I'll probably lose, like, 5 pounds before the season starts then just have, you know, five, four, five pounds to cut. But then whatever reason it got in my head that I wanted to go to 96 again. So yeah. I ended up cutting – all the way to 96 and it was it was crazy um but it was it was it was super effective like i mean it was i was a, so much bigger than everybody it was great and then i get to sectionals and i couldn't make weight <laughs> at the end oh, of the year oh <laughs> man that, yep. that's rough dude did you get like an extra pound at all with, yeah i got uh, extra, you got extra a couple yeah. pounds so it was um 98 and then uh nice. i think maybe so you get two pounds after like the Christmas break, and then I think maybe even like another pound. So maybe it was like ninety nine or something. But I was yeah. just I was getting so big. I would weigh in for dual meets and go uh, just one hundred three, and I would be I'd have to like start cutting for that. It was like I was I was yeah. cutting for the weight class above what I was going to wrestle at sectional. So it was it was uh, not a good idea. Man, so did you get into uh, train like strength training and stuff like? freshman year and yep. do you think yeah, that pretty much eighth grade ninth grade is when i got got really into it so that's actually part of it so i i got into it really heavy like my eighth grade ninth grade year so by the time my sophomore year came around i mean i was i was lifting a lot that's how i gained all that weight got up to like 120 um yeah so then cutting down to 96 i mean it was i mean this is i was as big as a as 90 a 96 pound person could be <laughs> which isn't very Man, big handle everybody yeah it was um it was uh, it was it was wild just because uh, especially because at ninety six pounds a lot of those kids they're they're all like freshmen or sophomore they're all younger kids and not a lot of them yeah. they don't really work out so and I was naturally strong and working out so it was just really from a, a strength perspective there was just a huge huge gap like I remember even saying a couple of times I was like man like I feel like that kid was had like a lot better skill but he just could not do anything like he just everything he did just I was like oh shit I feel I almost felt like I was two weight classes above the kids, which I really was. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's, that just goes to show you, I mean, cutting weight is effective. Um, Absolutely. You know, you, uh, yeah. you cut quite a bit of weight now for powerlifting, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. So for nationals, that's probably my biggest weight cut. I cut from walking around like 195, mm -hmm. down to 183. Yeah. How, uh, so what's your, what's your weight cut process like? Uh, okay, so are you familiar with uh, J.P. Couch's YouTube video on how to cut weight? Um, I don't think I've ever seen it. 
Uh, so it's, I follow like a very similar process. I kind of use that as uh, the baseline and then okay. I tweaked it a little bit from there. But uh, the basis of it, uh, the first thing is with uh, fiber. So around three days out, I would cut my fiber intake, you know, less than like 10 grams. Mm-hmm. And that just really helps to clear out your gut. And, you, you know, depending on how big you are, you can lose anywhere from like one to three pounds just through that. So what do you, um, um, what do you use for uh, food sources when you, when you cut out fiber? Yeah, so the food sources, it's actually just very energy dense. So I would, uh, are you familiar with the pure protein bars you yep. get at like Walmart? Yep. So those are pretty low in sodium. Uh, and of course, that close to the meat, you want to be cutting your sodium back. So I'll use, <laughs> I would literally eat, like, eat that like two or three times a day, uh, like three of those bars. Mm-hmm. I'd take some peanut butter and mix it with protein powder, smear it over the top and put it in the microwave. It was really good. Um, and it kept me full. So I was eating at maintenance. But the actual volume of the, of the food was just very, very small. So, yeah, that uh, doesn't uh, <clears throat> didn't like tear up your stomach at all. Like you felt fine on. on the... Uh, it, it yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because there's a lot of sugar alcohol in there. Yeah, the sugar alcohol. Is like, effect, but. I found that it, it um, it's really it just, I don't know. It's dependent on the person. Like me, sugar alcohols tear me up. Like they they really really bother me. Um. But like other, I mean, like my wife, she can eat, she could probably eat protein bars all day long and it doesn't affect her at all. Me, I eat like a half of one with sugar yeah. alcohols and I'm like sick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I usually don't have a, too much of a problem with it. So no, that's good. It worked out pretty well there. All right. So you do that. What, uh, what's the rest of the, pro- the protocol? Yeah. So, uh, of course, start water loading. So drinking like three gallons of water. Do you like start that earlier in the up. week? Yeah, so I competed on a Thursday. I think I started on uh, the uh, that Saturday before. Okay. Drinking uh, three gallons of water, like five grams of sodium. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's a lot of sodium. Getting yeah. a lot of water retention there. And then I think it was around three days out to so Monday or Tuesday. I can't remember off the top of my head. But I uh, cut the water back to like a gallon, dropped the sodium to like less than a gram, and also cut my carbohydrate intake down to like 100, 150 grams. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, yeah, I weighed in on Thursday at 6 p.m. So that Wednesday before, I uh, stopped eating and drinking at uh, noon. So 30 hours just uh, fasting. And uh, mm-hmm. it's actually interesting. That was my first time flying. I was flying on to Orlando that oh, day. Oh, really? That was the first time ever? Yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was a cool experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I got there. And also just making a body weight timeline. So mapping out what weight you need to be at specific times. So, for example, that, uh, I guess, midnight before, I wanted to weight like 188. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it just kind of keeps you on track. So I was able to hit that. And then I uh, woke up, it was like 187. Uh, and it was, a, it was a really nice day down in Florida. It was like 60 or 70 degrees. So um, just kind of went back to my wrestling roots, threw on a trash bag and uh, all of that, and just started walking outside with mm-hmm. the hoodie in. Uh, for about two hours and uh, lost like four or five pounds from that. Um, and then I think that was like 3.30, I think, and uh, I just got in the, the bathtub and found it off an extra pound, pound and a half. And getting out after that, like you have to really take your time or you might pass out. Mm-hmm. I've done that a few times. And in the bathtub, so you just filled up with as hot of water as possible, sit in there for how long, like 15, 20 minutes, then get out and then yeah. do it again? Yeah, exactly. I just did that, uh, I think, twice. Okay. And, uh, yeah, so I was, like, when I was on weights with the scale we had there at the Airbnb, and uh, I remember going in to check my weight at the venue 30 minutes before, and I was, like, 0.7 over. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I, uh, I had to throw on my sweats, and, you know, I didn't really think about it, you know, it was, comes back to that jocko things it's good you know yep. just staying calm and do my stuff back on uh, i got a spit bottle and some chewing gum yep and, that's uh, an old classic right airport. there yeah yeah and i just started running around uh in the front of the airport people probably drove off i was crazy as hell but i mm-hmm. uh, came back in and made the weight and then what um what'd you do to rehydrate oh man so i think uh First off, one of the big things with like rehydrating or getting your food back in after you weigh in is just staying calm. Uh, because if you're very anxious, you're very nervous, 
and you're in that sort of fight or flight mm-hmm. uh, response, it's hard to digest your food and keep it down. So literally, I was just really chilled out the entire time. I, I stepped off the scale. I just sat down, put some good music in. I chugged uh, like one or two Pedialytes mm-hmm. um, and just drank as much water as I could. And then I ate like 10 to 12 Rice Krispie Treats. I, I love those things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I haven't had one of those in a I, long time. Yeah. Yeah, those, those are really good. Um, I had like a Lenny and Larry cookie, I think, two of those. Mm-hmm. Had some Dunkin' Donuts, um, some pretzels. And, yeah, I, I ate a lot. Um, and we actually got an extra half, half hour after weigh-in. So That's nice. Yeah. I, I think I was also like 195 or 196. That's when awesome. So you, you key yeah. right off. So as soon as you get off the scale, it was Pedialyte and water. And then yep. pretty much you're trying to hit just pretty much carbs at that point. Yeah. For a certain, carbs. Did you have like a certain gram amount in mind or really just whatever it, it felt, what felt good? Pretty much just kind of what felt good. Just auto regulating, I guess, mm-hmm. with the, the intake there. Did you, uh, what about uh, electrolytes? Were you just kind of letting the, the Pedialyte handle that, or did you salt some of the food or whatever? Oh, yeah. I did uh, take, like, a shot of soy sauce. Okay. I forgot to mention that. All right, yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Quick soy sauce. So then how, how did you feel? Like, after the, was that the, so you said that was the biggest weight cut you've done for, for powerlifting? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And you felt um, felt fine, or w- did you feel any effects, like, during the, during the meet? During the warm-ups for squat, I did. Uh, initially, uh-huh. um, I think uh, it, I was struggling to put my belt on. Like I couldn't get to the, the belt notch I usually go to. Uh-huh. Uh, so it took a minute for like the food to actually die down. I did a few warm ups beltless uh, before I could actually throw it on. But uh, by the time I went out and took the first attempt, it, it was I was good to go. So yeah, that's awesome. Did you did you cut a lot of weight in for wrestling? I did. Yeah, so yep. you had the experience. What was uh, what was your weight cutting in, in high school? In high school, it, it was just, um, you had Bryce Meredith on a few days ago. It was yep. very similar to that where uh, after, you know, the competition on Saturday or whatever, I would just eat everything in sight. Um, and then Monday and Tuesday, I kind of ate what I wanted. And then basically Wednesday, Thursday, I mean, usually Friday, we would weigh in for a tournament or something. Just very little, you know, like probably less than 1,000 calories on some days. Yeah. Like just didn't have that knowledge base i guess back then so what uh what that weights did you wrestle in in high school yeah wrestled uh 103 freshman year then bumped up to 125 sophomore year 138 junior year and then 152 uh, senior year nice so how did uh how'd your high school career go it went really good um freshman year was uh really good uh all the region finals and won that um sophomore year I did okay. It was you know I gained a lot of weight from yeah, that's a big the bodybuilding jump. training. Yeah, yeah. So it was a little different, you know. The freshman year, I was used to just kind of manhandling some guys, yep. uh, especially on top, hitting tilts and things like that. Going up to one twenty five, it's a lot different, you know. Like I had to get much more proficient on my feet. Yep. Uh, just because it was harder to turn those guys, and you know it was a little different. So um, had to adjust there, and then I made it to. Uh, the semifinals and I lost that match and I had an injury default to, uh, to six because uh, I think I like uh, cracked the rib oh, in that shit. Uh, semifinal. Yeah. Um, junior year at 138, I made it to the quarterfinals at state and uh, I-, I lost that match in overtime. I think it was double overtime. Oh, man. Yeah, it's actually, you know, I, I remember just feeling broken after that, and uh, the next two matches I wrestled, I just got pinned. You know, just kind of gave up mentally. Yeah, and in uh, in so was, that was in Virginia. What were the uh, double overtime rules in in Virginia? Hmm. So, I think in the in the first overtime, you start on the feet. I yep. think it's uh, the first takedown win. Yeah, it was like one minute think, on your feet. Yeah, and then I think. If uh, if it's still if it gets a double overtime, I think one guy goes down. Yep. And um, it, what is it like? If you escape, um, you basically win. Yeah. So this That's is it. this is what I wanted to bring up. So uh, my I think it was my sophomore year. 
they changed it in New York. That was the first year they changed the double overtime rules where it used to be, so you go to overtime, one minute on your feet, first takedown wins. If, it, if no one takes anybody down, it goes to double overtime, then you flip the, the coin, whoever wins gets to choose top or down, and this is double overtime. If you choose yeah. down, you have 30 seconds to get out. If you get out, you win. If you end up on top, you just got to hold the guy down for 30 seconds. That's how it always was. So then New York changed it that year to where it was uh, 30 seconds. So you go to double overtime, you flip the coin, per- person chooses down, whatever. You have to go the full 30 seconds. Like, it, like it's not sudden death at that point. Like you get out, that's fine, but now the other person has a chance to like take you down to like win, and then the other person goes down. You know what I mean? So, that, like, both yeah. people have a chance to go down. So, essentially, what happens is if the person on, on bottom doesn't get out, normally they would lose, but you have to switch, and then it could keep going. Well, I get, I get in a tough match. I was losing a match, like, five to nothing with this kid. He was, like, the, one of the better kids at the next week class up. I bumped up for the dual meet. It was, like, five to nothing. I'm getting beat. There's, like, probably 30 seconds to go in the match. I'm like, ah. In my head, I was like, ah, I'm not gonna, there's nothing I can really do. I've tried everything against this kid. I can't even score a point. And then he, like, tes- shoots, like, a terrible shot on me for whatever reason, like, dumb. And, like, I just get behind him and then turn him. And I'm, like, literally have the kid pinned and get two takedown, three back points. If the time didn't run out, I would have pinned him. Uh, we go to overtime. We're both, like, completely exhausted. No, you know, no takedowns. Goes to double overtime. I win the coin toss, and I'm like, okay, I'm going down. Like, I can, I'll just dig deep, and I'm going to end up getting out and winning. Like, this is just, like, I'm, I'm going to get out. Go down, get right out, turn around. The kid, we both, we both think, wait, one, like, he's like, he's like, like crying. I like get up, turn around, start walking back to the, the center. And I, as I'm walking back to the center, I hear the ref say, keep wrestling. And then I was like, Oh, what the fuck? I so I turn around and as soon as I turn around, the kid's like full on double leg, like right <laughs> into me. Get double leg right to my uh, back. I was like, what the <laughs> fuck is going on? <laughs> so then he he gets he gets a takedown. Now he's getting back points on me. And then uh so then, then like 30 seconds goes out. So then it's his turn to go down. And now I'm like down like four points. I'm like, what the what is going on? So I end up losing. Yeah. So oh man, that was wild. That, that, that's rough, man. Yeah, that was crazy. That was a crazy match. Yeah, you know, I don't think a lot of people realize how tough those types of matches are. Just wrestling in general. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a tough sport. It definitely is. Yeah. Did you uh, yeah, do any wrestling after high school? Uh, so after my senior year, um, I I decided to go to Virginia Tech, and I really just did, I was burnt out with it at that yep. point, man. Um, just been doing it for so long and just cutting weight. Uh, you know, I, I really like the training side of things at that point a lot more, mm-hmm. um, especially train, uh, strength training. So I, I think my senior year, I started doing one there's five, three, one. That was like my first. It's a, it's, I was going to say, that's a, a lot of people's introduction to, uh, you know, strength programming essentially. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I really liked it because of the idea I could get stronger and still stay in my weight class. So I yep. was doing that uh, throughout high school. And uh, I got to Virginia Tech. And, you know, I'd always been really big into YouTube um, and just watching sort of the, some of the guys in the fitness industry. And uh, I got introduced to Johnny Candido. I was going to say Candido. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's a, that's a common story, I feel like. Mm-hmm. Um, and he really kind of inspired me to step on the platform and compete and uh the first meet i did uh i think brandon Lilly hosted it in uh kentucky in 2014 i started out uspa it was just nearby and i was really big and like the animal cage stuff and mm-hmm. i thought it was really cool well you kind of look uh, like dan green <laughs> especially when you had the hair yeah 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 for sure that, that was also a pretty pretty big influence um so i went down there and competed and then been history ever since man so what um when you first got into lifting you said you're doing like bodybuilding style stuff did you feel like you were pretty strong like right off the bat like did you just walk in and, and strength was something you knew you'd be able to uh progress pretty well on yeah you know when i started out i think i i, I can't even remember 
like my freshman year, I think I might have squatted like 185. Um, mm-hmm. Bench was like I could barely get 115, mm-hmm. and then deadlift. I, we didn't really deadlift. We just did like power cleans. And yeah, stuff we didn't like deadlift that. either. We actually, th- my so when I first got into lifting, eighth grade, ninth grade year, I uh, just went into the weight room after after wrestling, and uh, looking back, the the program that we were doing, like it was. <laughs> unbelievable <laughs> the, yeah. the program we were doing um we didn't squat we didn't deadlift um we didn't do any olympic lift. we didn't we really didn't do anything besides we benched we did bench which i am grateful for that introduced me to the bench uh yeah so we, we benched we did like lat pull downs maybe like leg press curls upright rows like that was like the workout and we did yep. that three days a week that was the workout. Yep, right there, right there with you, man. <laughs> yeah, I actually started on a Smith machine squat. Actually. Yeah, we didn't even do yeah. that. We did a we did a universal leg press, one of oh, those man. real <laughs> shitty ones too, like on a universal machine. It wasn't even like a yeah. vertical leg press. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh man! Oh man! Yeah, it was, it was um, brutal. Yeah, so I, I really wasn't, you know, I wasn't, you know, extraordinarily strong or anything when I first started. Um, I just love the process of trading. I really didn't care what was on the bar, man. I just like loved it. Um, and I, I just did it like all the time. And, mm-hmm. uh, I started like my sophomore year with, you know, really the bodybuilding type stuff. And I can remember going in and I think, uh, by the end of that summer, before I went into my sophomore year, I was able to squat like three fifteen. Mm-hmm. And uh, bench, I think uh, I might have got to like one fifty five, one sixty five, and three fifteen um, squats pretty big for uh, a sophomore. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, the squats always been my favorite lift. Yeah, I just trained it, trained it a lot. Um, I, I'm kind of an adrenaline junkie, so mm-hmm. oh, I just I feel like that's like the most dangerous lift. Yeah, it really is when you think about it. I mean, you yeah. have all the weight on your back, and uh, you know, it, I think it's the most. Uh, intimidating for people too yeah. to go heavy. Yeah. You know, I mean, a deadlift is just—I mean, if you don't get it, you just drop it. And then a bench, a lot of yeah. times you have a spotter, so it's—you know—you're you're, not—you're not as intimidated by the weight. But on the squat, um, even even with a spotter, I mean, you have the weight on your back. You you think in your head, you're like, oh, if I don't get this, I'm gonna get like pinned to the rack or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That that's what I love about it. You know, I always love doing in that time period, just doing like AMRAP sets and really just pushing past those mental barriers. Mm -hmm. You know, you get to like 15 reps, you can't feel your hands. You're like gasping for air and you just keep knocking them out. And every one of the gyms looking at you crazy. And, you know, I just, I got addicted to that and just proving a point that I might not be the biggest, but I'm going to work harder than everyone here. You know, I feel like in in everybody who's listening and they're probably like, Oh man, like Kyle's going to bring up wrestling here. But, uh, no, I feel like that's like part of like the wrestler mindset, you know. Um, Definitely, and I, I get it. I'm sure like other sports have it too. But um, for everybody who's who wrestled, like it's it's a vi- it's very easy. And I'm not saying all wrestlers have it, but I'm it's I'm just saying it's very common for uh, someone who is involved in wrestling for a long time. Then when they get into to lifting, to have that mindset, they just want to kill it. You know what I mean? They just want to like go yeah. above and beyond, put in so much effort. Uh, because you're used to it. You're used to this stuff. So it's where you're, we might not be used to training per se in terms of uh, weightlifting, but the training for, you know, whether it's calisthenics or just live wrestling, it translates very well to the amount of effort you need to, to put towards your training. And I think it's just very easy to, uh, you know, for a wrestler to really crush it in the gym. Whereas you take somebody else, a, a non athlete, especially a non-athlete, they've never really redlined their body. So that the idea of really pushing themselves, it's just foreign. It's not even, uh, I don't even know if it's a, a mental thing, really. It's just a, it's just so so much of a foreign concept that they don't know how to do it. You don't know how to put in the amount of ten, the intensity because you've never done it before. Yeah. I think a lot of people, you know, miss out on that. And they just don't know how to really push themselves and to grind and to have that attitude about it. You know, you watch, uh, I'm sure you watch the NCAA tournament for wrestling. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Those Iowa guys every year, they just have that attitude where they just attack constantly. And I, I carry that same mindset with my training. 
like the days we do like uh, eight sets of three at like 85, 86 mm-hmm. percent. Those are like my favorite days because after each set, I rack it. I take like one to two minutes to check how it looked and make any adjustments I need to. I'm mm-hmm. right back in it just constantly getting after it the entire time. Yeah. You need that. You need that mentality. Yeah. You really do. Um, did the, Yeah, Iowa. Were you a, uh, growing up, were you like a, a big Dan Gable fan? Yeah. Did you get into this shit? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was uh, it was funny with when I had Bryce on the podcast. We were talking about how all Iowa kids look the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they really do, man. They do. They, they really do. Well, um, that yeah, spent, yeah. you uh, so you watched the the uh, the Nationals. Um, I was pretty in, in, impressed with Spencer Lee at freshman. Yeah, man. Yeah, he yeah. Was impressive. That guy's yeah. That He's from. Um, did you do you know anything about his story? He's from Pittsburgh. He was undefeated in high school. And then his last, his, literally the state finals of uh, his senior year, he ended up getting beat, but he was hurt. He had like a, I don't know, like a torn ACL or something, but he got hurt. Yeah. And it was his last match. Um, it was wild. Yeah, he was a, he's a, he's a stud, though. Kid's a stud. Yeah. So yeah, what's, uh, what's your training look like now? Uh, so right now we're training uh, four days a week. Um, of course, being in PT school, it just kind of, you know, works better that way to mm-hmm. have that extra day of recovery. Um, and right now we're squat benching and deadlifting on the first day, um, squat bench on the second day. So that's usually Wednesday for me. Squat bench, deadlift on Friday. And then uh, we do, yeah, just bench on uh, Saturday and some accessories and there's accessories and things sprinkled throughout. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you're days. squatting three days a week, benching how many days, and deadlifting how many days? Uh, benching four days and then uh, deadlifting twice. All right. So you're benching every day. You're yeah. in the gym. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So yeah. So it's probably tough to uh, to balance the the training with uh, being in, in school and, and all that stuff. How does that go? Oh, uh, it's, it's been going great, man. I think, uh, you talked about on one of your recent podcasts, just blocking out times and, yep. uh, you know, sticking to that schedule. And, you know, if you can really just have the discipline to do that, you, you can make the time for pretty much anything. Yeah. That's, uh, so, it's so important. You know, I think, um, you know, and this is something too, that I've found and I've always found, uh, and especially with, with doing this podcast that a lot of times the busiest people, the people who, you, you would think in your head, you're like, oh, there, there's no way they're going to be able to make time to do a podcast or there's no way they're going to be able to make time to do this. They make, they just do it. Like they're the ones that like, they don't even have a problem with it. It's the, it tends to be the people who aren't very busy that they're not very busy for a reason because they don't get anything done. Like they don't do anything. The busy people, yeah. they, they're on top of their shit. Their, their time management's a lot better. And even, I could even look at myself, um, you know, I've gotten so much better at time management. The more shit I put on my plate, the more stuff I do, the the better I I am. Especially it, being an entrepreneur, um, yeah. You know, like I don't really. I mean, I could I could wake up and do whatever I want pretty much all day as long as the work gets done. But I found over the years that the more structured I can be, the more I can you know you know really just plan out my day to the point to where I know what I'm doing at every every hour. The more I get done, and then it's better off for right. everybody. Yeah, it keeps you sharp, man. You can really surprise yourself with how much you can actually accomplish when you just, you know, take the opportunities as they come and just run with it and just have the discipline to to keep knocking those tasks, you know, prioritize and execute. Boom, boom, boom. And just knock it out. Yeah, yeah. What's uh, what's your nutrition like? You stay pretty lean. Yeah, you, you're one of the more aesthetic uh, power lifters. <laughs> Thank you, man. Um <laughs> So I started tracking uh, macros and things, uh, I guess, since 2009. I remember okay. getting, like, one of those bodybuilding.com journals. Yeah, I had one of like, those. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would just write out, like, you know, I started out very bro, uh, like, with my food selection. So, like, chicken breast, rice, um, tuna, broccoli, all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I think it was around, like, 2013, I was you know, took a more flexible approach. So I just kind of know where my maintenance is at. And, mm-hmm. you know, depending on what my goals are, I'll eat, uh, you know, either in a surplus or just maintain. And uh, so mainly it was track, tracking macros and, uh, you know, trying to hit my 
and my goals there. It's, you know, the basic stuff you've heard from pretty much everyone else. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's important to, you know, this, I, I say this too, is like when, when shit gets brought up a lot, it's, it's important. That's what, you know, if that's what everyone, if most people are doing one thing, it's probably smart for you to do it. Definitely. What does uh, like what does a sample day look like? I know it's probably probably changes quite a bit, but just to give everyone kind of a, a look at uh, what a day of eating would look like. Yeah, yeah. So today I, I woke up and I had uh, two uh, two turkey sausage breakfast sandwiches from like an English muffin, and uh, I eat that with some Greek yogurt and uh, some like cereal sprinkle on top. Get a uh, you know some fruit. Mm-hmm. Uh, for lunch, I'll probably have uh, some rice, tuna, and maybe uh, like a smoothie or something with some veggies. Um, and then after after I train later today, I'll probably have uh, I might go to Chipotle. Yeah, actually, that's get, always uh, a good option. Yeah, yeah and get a uh, a bowl. And um, I've actually been trying like getting the romaine lettuce and just putting the bowl in the. I've been doing that bowl. lately. That's yeah, like, that's yeah. like the that's like the cheat to life. Yeah, definitely, man. <laughs> yeah. So Throw I'm, some I'm extra salsa, hot salsa on there. Yeah, it, it's so good. Um, so I'm right around 20, 2,800 calories right now. Just slowly cut down to around 193, and I'm just going to maintain that um, and water cut down to uh, weight class at world. Yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, that'll be good. So um, yeah. what? Uh, let's give you some uh, some gym cred here. What um, What are your best lifts in, in the gym and in competition? So in the gym, the best squat is, uh, uh, I think, 625. Uh, bench, 410, and then deadlift, 700. Uh, on the platform, uh, best performance is at Nationals. So hit a 629 or 628-point-something squat, uh, 396 bench, and then a 655 deadlift. Cool, cool. Yeah, so what are your, <clears throat> what are your goals um, heading forward here? Uh, so... Right now, the main goal is to, to win a world championship. So, uh, you know, we're just going to take it one day at a time, make the most out of every training session and whatever's there on meet day. Uh, that's, uh, that's what we're going to take. So um, I just love the process of training, man. And, you know, going to these big competitions, it really brings out the best in me, you know, competing against guys like Sean or, or Russ. You know, these guys are, are constantly pushing themselves, and it, it forces me to really bring out – the best in myself and i'm very grateful for that yeah I think a lot you, of people have missed that you yeah know, i was just gonna say that. that you know the uh the competition aspect is is great because especially <clears throat> especially nowadays with social media it's pretty easy to see what everyone's doing in a way i like that because every day you have that that motivation like if you're seeing what your competitors are doing it's like okay i see you over there let's let's i gotta step yeah. up my shit you know it's just there's there's a huge benefit to that I think just because it's everyone's pushing themselves to get better. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, going back to uh, managing time, like the training, it, it makes me better. Like it makes me so much, it make, makes me a better communicator. It allows me to get my work done. It keeps me focused. You know, it keeps me sharp. So um, there's just a huge, huge benefit to just loving the training process. Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, you know, when your training's dialed in and going well, it leaks over into the rest of your life. For sure. Yeah. The um, the, the cool thing about powerlifting, too, is it's all numerical. Like, everything's number-based. So it's very easy for you to, to, like, know when things are going well. It's just like, okay, my numbers are going well. My numbers are going up. It's it's very easy for you to just, like, say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm on the right track here. And then, like, your, your mood gets better everything gets elevated that way where I think sometimes when people don't not just if they don't compete in powerlifting but if they're not as is focused on um numbers based if they're more just looking in the mirror with aesthetics or their physique or whatever your mood gets like changed based off from things that don't even really matter it's like you wake up and you're like oh man I'm I don't feel like I'm looking as good today now you're like now that like ruins your your fucking day, but where it's numerical with powerlifting, it's like okay, are my numbers going up? My numbers are going up. It's very easy to see that that progress that way. Yeah, definitely, man. And uh, 
You know, I think another thing that's common, I, I struggle with this at times too. You see other guys putting up bigger numbers and your training might not be going as well. A lot of times people just get depressed or get upset with things like that. Uh, so I think just learning how to let go of what other people are doing or whether or not, you know, you're, you're winning at these big meets or how much, how many followers you have, just go in there and get after it and just enjoy that process, man. That's, that's what it's all about. And it's going to make you a better person in that, you know, you don't need powerlifting. You don't need all this recognition to be a good person as, as cheesy as that sounds, but yeah. there's so much truth in it. Well, it's the, it's the other side to, of the coin here because we're talking about, Oh, this the idea that, um, you know, you're, you're able to see your competitors or see other guys in your weight class or just see other people in general on social media crushing their training. It's very easy, you know, because on one side, yeah, there's the benefit in that. It's like it's going to be motivating. You're, it's going to push you to do your best. But if your best isn't quite up to what everyone else is doing, it, like you said, it's, it's, it's easy just to become depressed and, and kind of feel like, oh, I'm never going to be that strong. But it's important just to remember two two things. One, hey, they their training might not have been that good. That that workout might have been they might have had one good set and that was what you saw. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or they exactly. might have had one good day last week. That's what you saw, and it's just really just the highlights. And again, yeah. with powerlifting too, is it? It's yeah, it's a, it's a sport in where it's you know obviously you're competing with everybody else, but it's also a sport that it's very easy just to compete with yourself. Again, with it's it's numerical, so you know exactly where you were last time based off from the numbers. So then next time, you really just have to compete with yourself. And as long as you're getting better, and as it, it, shitty as that sounds, because I, I say that, and I'm a super competitive person. Like I'm like, if yeah. I'm competing, I want to beat people. But you can't beat people if you're not getting better yourself. You know what I mean? Like yeah, you yeah. can if you just go to a shitty meet or something. But no, that's not that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the, at the elite level. You're not going to be able to consistently beat other people if you're not consistently beating yourself. Exactly, and you know it's it's just a, a balancing act. And, you know, being able to take inspiration from those guys crushing it, and also being detached enough not to let it affect your own mindset and your own training, and just you know taking inspiration from it. Yeah. Do you um, when you're in the gym? Do you what do you think about like when you're training? It's kind of a strange question, but I'm interested. Yeah. yeah. So usually, when I walk into the gym, man, it's it's a switch. Mm-hmm. You, you know, it's it's you, you've wrestled so you know that switch right before you, when you put on and you strap on the headgear mm-hmm. and you're about to go wrestle this guy. You know, it's it's just this default aggressive like. I don't see anything else except this barbell and I'm going to execute all my cues aggressively. I'm going to pull the bar down over my back and then draw the ribs down, going to inflate, you know, going to do all these things. And I'm just laser focused on whatever it is I'm doing in the gym. You know, I'll put on some good music and, um, just go and get after it. Do you think Um, about, uh, like being on the on the platform, do you think about competition, or are you really just thinking about you know in the moment the weight, the sets, the reps? Yeah, so in between my sets, I'll visualize it. I'll mm-hmm. visualize the next set. I'll visualize how the weight's going to feel on my back. I'll visualize walking it out. You know all those processes. You know the feeling of you know knocking out three reps. You know how it's going to feel. Um, but when I'm actually executing, it's I'm just completely in the moment focused. And I think meditation has helped a lot with that too. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Headspace app, yep. but uh, I've been using that for about a year and a half now. I do that consistently, try to do like 10 minutes a day. And I think that has certainly, you know, helped me to train my brain to not get distracted and to stay focused and in the moment. Yeah. Do, do you do anything else outside of the gym other than uh, meditation that you think helps you in, in the gym? Um, waking up early. Yeah. I, I think, uh, for me, just waking up early and, uh, I think that's helped. And I do a lot of breathing drills and things outside of the gym too. Um, like the 90, 90 breathing. So 90 at the knees, 90 at the hip. If you look it up on YouTube, there's a bunch of videos, but, uh, mm-hmm. I feel like, uh, those types of breathing drills kind of reinforce, you know, keeping, uh, the hips underneath you and, uh, being able to draw the ribs down and brace. I think that that's a really good drill to do um, outside of the gym. Um, 
Yeah. That, you uh, uh, you wake up early. What time do you wake up? Uh, so usually around 5.30, okay. I'll wake up and I'll uh, take a cold shower uh, after I check my weight. Um, it comes back to that mental toughness thing. Like if you can wake up first thing in the morning and take a cold-ass shower, um, everything else throughout the day is pretty easy. So that's like the first test for me. Yeah. Um, so I'll do that. Um, I usually have my phone on airplane. Um, and I have my headspace thing downloaded. So I'll, I'll meditate, uh, after I get out of the shower there, then I'll read for like 30 minutes to an hour and then, uh, do whatever I need to do, uh, the rest of the day, you know, whether it's school stuff or, um, looking at like training stuff, whatever it is, and just go from there. I like it. What time do you, uh, you should go to bed? Usually go to bed around nine thirty to 10. Okay. Um, but as I get closer to competition, I'll probably switch it to where I'm getting nine to ten hours of sleep, just to really favor that recovery because that, that makes a huge, huge difference. Yeah, it definitely does. Get. Yeah. Do you do anything other when you're leading up to the the meet other than uh, increasing your sleep for recovery? Anything else? Um, you know, I think a big thing is just managing managing my stress levels and just being aware of that too, yep. you know, not getting overwhelmed with school stuff or, you know, social media, like not getting drawn into, Oh, this guy's doing this. What's this guy doing? Not, mm-hmm. Cause that stresses you out. Oh yeah, it definitely does. Yeah. Yeah. So just being, uh, you know, really relaxed and chilled out when I'm not training, I think really helps. I think, recovery. I think stress is something that doesn't, I don't know if it doesn't get talked about enough, or maybe it's just people don't think about it uh, enough, but everything you're doing, especially leading up to a me, but everything you do is, is a stressor, including your training is a stressor. So in order to you know, recover and be optimal in your training sessions, you want to try to eliminate or at least limit the other outside stressors, especially the stuff that you don't, that, that's not important. You know, yeah, we're we're all going to have stress. We're all going to have daily stress, job stress, school stress. And it's really hard to avoid that stuff. But like you said, like stuff on social media, you know, a little petty stuff that's going on in your life, those little stresses. A lot of times if you're, if you're focused on something, it's just better to forget about that stuff (laughs) as best, you know, sometimes it's easier said than done, but it's, that would make a big difference. Yeah, just picking your battles wisely. Like if someone cuts you off in traffic, it's still within your control whether or not you have to get pissed off about it. Yep. So you can just, you know, just relax and just carry on with your day. 100%. Charlie, this has been this yeah. has been awesome. Yeah, man. I really appreciate you bringing me on. It's been, a, it's been an awesome time. Yeah, this is a fun conversation. How can uh, how can people find out more information about you? Uh, so you can check out my Instagram at cdixon3245, and that's uh, – Pretty much the only social media I'm active on. So. Yeah, I'll put uh, I'll put the link in the show notes. Definitely, everyone go go check him out. Strong dude, aesthetic dude too. I think people will notice that. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. <laughs> awesome, man. Dude, this was good. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Absolute Strength Podcast. I know I had a ton of fun producing it for you. And before you go, if you could just drop me some feedback, I'd love it. I love reading your feedback. So you can go over to iTunes, leave a five-star rating, write a little review of what you think of the podcast. I absolutely love it. I read every single one. But it's cool if you don't want to do that. I get it. I get it. No one wants to really go out of their way to, to do anything, let alone write a review. But I want to get your feedback. So send me, drop me a line on Instagram at Hunt Fitness or on Facebook kyle hunt or on twitter or send a, a pigeon or something I don't, I don't know i just want to hear your feedback so if you want to give me some feedback let me know what you think hit me up on instagram at hunt fitness and before you go i have one last thing one last thing i want to say i have a program i want you to check out it's actually called the absolute strength program and the link is in the show notes it's a program i designed to help increase my own squat bench and deadlift and i got pretty strong off of it and i think you're gonna like it it's a, it's a great book thousands of people have got amazing results from it It's in the show notes. All right, guys. Until next time. Until next episode. Peace.